Oh, hello, Cecil. Hello, Aspen. Welcome to my home. Thank you for having us. What makes this space feel like home? Besides my pet cow pig, uh, good vibes, good food, definitely good people, good things all around. That's all you need. Now, I want to ask you a few questions about your research. You started your journey in HCI and data visualization, and then you moved to ML and interpretability. Tell me about that. Mm, yeah, I think on the surface, those two fields seem very different, but they both deal with this fundamental question of data and how do we as people make inferences on that data and make decisions with that data. So that's you know the connection. Um, I really wanted to be a well-rounded researcher and I loved the way that machine learning researchers and theorists often formalize, evaluate, and ask questions. And so, yeah, that's, that's really what got us here is well-roundedness. Okay, very interdisciplinary approach. Now I'm getting a little distracted by that record player. Do you have any favorites? I have so many. Um, I listen to this record a lot when I'm working. It's Moonchild. Um, it's got that R&B lo-fi energy that I think is just very conducive to work. So priorities. All right, I'll have to give that a listen. Now back to your research. One pillar is data sets. How significant is building representative data sets in today's ML landscape? I think it's one of the most important questions that we have is like a lot of the problems that come from bias um, and issues of fairness in machine learning tie back to having not representative data sets. So how can we build those data sets that cover, you know, the people, the axes that we care about so that the product or tool that we build is, is working the way we want it to. And what are some fundamental challenges that you've run into doing this type of work? Well, anytime you're trying to build something that is representative, it's very hard to figure out what is not represented. So I would say that is the number one challenge. All right, now I've heard of something called additive distribution methods. What are they? Oh, good question. Um, additive distribution methods are this kind of like field in machine learning where people ask, okay, well, I know what is in my training set. Um, I know what my model has learned. Now, can I figure out what the model is going to kind of do poorly on that maybe is not within that distribution? So it's out of distribution. Sometimes we call that anomaly detection. It depends on if you're working with time series or you know a different data type. And how are you connecting that with data collection? That is also a really good question. Um, so I think until maybe recently, we really had these topics very separated. Um, but it turns out if you have a sense of the underlying distribution of your data set um, and you take a partially trained model, you can use that model and those additive distribution methods to target, direct, and iterate your data collection so that in the long run you have a much more representative data set. Okay, I see a big pile of books behind you as well. Sorry, I keep getting distracted. Any favorites here? Oh, I've got a lot. Um, let's go with these two. Uh, Whereas by Laylee Long Soldier, amazing, amazing poet. She really knows how to work with sound. I love it. And objectivity. Gotta have it, gotta love it. You know what time it is? It's time to go to work. <laughs> Speaking of that, what's a typical day like at Seasale? You know what? I'll show you. Let's go. On my way to work, I usually listen to audiobooks, podcasts, or the occasional Spotify playlist. What are you listening to right now? I'm listening to KUER's Radio West. It is a fantastic radio show slash podcast. Okay, sounds very popular for the East Coast. Now, another pillar of your research, fundamental ML work, super applicable right now. Can you explain the debate on emergent world models? Um, sure. Uh, large language models um, have been facing this really big question, which is, are they just stochastic parrots, so memorizing surface statistics, or are they learning something a little bit more meaningful about the world? Uh, it's an ongoing debate, like you said. So there you go, it's, it's been summarized. All right, so how do you think looking at really specific context is helping explore this question? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so a couple of months ago, my co-authors and I presented some work at iClear. We basically found an emergent world model uh, in a large language model that was trained from scratch on a fellow move, so super, super tightly constrained environment. And that model was controllable and causal, which is really exciting um, for the future of interpretability, in my opinion. But it's also just the beginning of the work. 
So does that mean we're a little bit closer to deploying safer AI? Uh, we're definitely not actively deploying safer AM, uh, ML. And uh, I would say that we are also fully not finished with the interpretability research landscape, although we're getting a lot closer. OK, so then with the ubiquity of LLMs, people are starting to use them to generate training data sets. So what are some challenges in using them for that? Another fantastic question, Rachel. Um, I, I have to say, so you know, one of the nice things about large language models is they're really good at producing realistic outputs. Um, but they're not so good at producing realistic distributions. So any model that you train on that resulting distribution may have some problems. Look, it's the dome. I'm gonna go to work because I am now incredibly late from spending time with you guys. I'll see you at the office. Oh my gosh. Welcome to work. Oh, well thank you, Aspen. Of course. All right, Aspen, tell me a little bit about your current work, the AI supply chain. What is that? That's a, another good question, Rachel. You're so full of them. Uh, um, so up until now, all the AI products that you might interact with, like chatbots, Siri, Alexa, and AI radiology assistant, were largely built in-house along one pipeline. So data cleaning, development, refinement, evaluation, training, etc., was kind of ordered and organized by like one entity. Now it's a little different. The products that you interact with are basically a bunch of different things glued together, whether that's data sets, models, fine-tuned models. The world is changing, and we're thinking of this as a dispersed learning setting where you can have a lot of different entities influencing the downstream inferences. Okay, and how does dispersed learning impact the mitigation of bias and fairness in AI? That's a really good question. So when you have you know, more than one entity contributing to a downstream product. Um, and by entity, it could be an organization, it could be a person. Um, but you know, you have kind of like this idea of the downstream product doesn't have control over up in the upstream products that are influencing it. Um, as a result, it's really hard to tell if something changes upstream and there's now a failure here, who's responsible? And this is a question of like liability and accountability, and it's one of the big questions that we are trying to explore with the dispersed learning setting. And how could these challenges alter future developments in ML? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, you know, big problem. Um, in dispersed learning in the AI supply chain, uh, we're now trying to figure out how do you deal with bias and fairness when there are many actors that are playing a role in learning? Um, it's hard. You can have two perfectly fair models and you maybe combine them um, through um, voting. There's a lot of different ways to combine models, but um, you can average their weights, for example. And the result, you know, has this weird sense of like, well, who did what? And now how do we know what's wrong? Um, so it challenges stereotypical debugging strategies, um, debiasing um, strategies, etc. Okay, big open problem. So I want to shift a little bit. How have all of your non-academic experiences shaped your research and policy interests? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I mean, I think that's a really big question and one that is hard to answer. Uh, I would say I'm just very passionate about making people's lives better um, and kind of getting to the heart of truth. And there are many ways to approach that from a policy perspective, and there are many ways to approach that from a research perspective. Okay, now for all of this work, how do you balance the interdisciplinary nature of projects, especially with fields like sociology and anthropology? Mm, I think finding good collaborators is an excellent way to do that. Um, also, reading a lot. How do you stay on top of what's happening in your research field? I think my lab's a really good resource uh, and academic Twitter, although I guess it's called X now. Yeah. Um, yeah, talking to people, it's a good way to do it. All right, moving on from the more technical stuff, you moved from Utah to Cambridge for MIT. That must have been quite the transition. Big culture shock, for sure. All right, so did you venture outside of MIT for any collaborations now that you've been here? 
You know what, I did. I got really lucky with um, collaborations at Harvard and with people at Caltech and Art Center and with people at Apple from doing internships. So very happy about those experiences. That's wonderful. Now research can obviously be a long and arduous process. So talk to me about some of the setbacks and what insights you've gleaned from that. Yeah, I mean, research is an arduous process and you often think something will work and then it doesn't and then you try another thing and it doesn't. And uh, I think one of the biggest things that you can develop as a researcher is a sense of resiliency and stubbornness um, and a thick skin, as someone once told me. And throughout that process, have you had any amazing mentorships or mentors? You know what, I, really, I definitely have. Um, I think my current advisor, Alexander Madri, is an amazing mentor. I got really lucky in undergrad with having amazing women mentors that were professors that otherwise I probably would not have even considered academia an option. So, uh, yeah. How has your approach to research matured over time? You get better at asking good questions. You have a better sense of the existing literature, of what questions are interesting to the research community and to yourself, and also how to start answering them. So, uh, maturity, I guess. <laughs> All right, so are there any fun MIT traditions or hidden spots on campus that outsiders might not know about? Um, maybe the Muddy. It's a pub <laughs> uh, for MIT affiliates, and it is quite the space to hear the occasional witty banter. It's quite a scene. Is there anything about MIT that you wish you knew before you started here? Yeah, um, you know, what they say about the hose being a water hose when you come here, uh, it's definitely true. Um, you feel like you're drowning for a little bit and then you get your feet under you and you recalibrate and figure out your people and it takes a minute, but it's worth it. I can only imagine. So after a long day's work, then what helps you recharge? Um, yoga, mindfulness, sleeping. All good things. Oh, hi. <laughs> Aspen, I was wondering, through your research journey, do you have any piece of advice that is the most impactful? Find people you like and work with them. Although we haven't worked together yet. This Not is Kimia. <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> All right, we're going now. Bye. Aspen, favorite CS resource? The internet. Movie. Oh, God, this is going to be hard. Happy as Lazaro. <laughs> All right, favorite restaurant in Boston? I didn't say this is going to be easy. Uh... Um, Time's Out isn't a restaurant, but it's got a bunch of options, and I like it. Okay, artist? Um, my mom. Class at MIT. Bills and Billions. Ooh, you're doing great, aren't you? Uh, this is pretty tough. All right, if you're stranded on a desert island, three things you could take with you, what's it going to be? Ooh, uh, I guess a fishing pole, sunscreen, and a desalinator. Is that, is that how you say that? Not what I would choose, but okay. What's one thing that recently inspired you? Besides you. Oh, you're too kind. I am <laughs> um, taking a Harvard class called The Art of Listening, and I think it's been really inspirational. Mm, it sounds incredible. All right, Dream Lab, anyone from history, who's coming? You know what? I uh, don't know those people, so <laughs> I'll probably stick to the people I'm working with now because they're wonderful, kind, and super smart. Favorite language to program in? Python. All right, if you could have any piece of AI technology automate something, what would it be? I want the perfect laundromat. Yes, I would like that as well. Let me know if you figure it out. Okay, if your research project was a dish, what would it be? Sushi. Okay. <laughs> I love raw fish. All right, if you hadn't pursued a career in academia and research, what other career path would you have taken? I mean, this is still in research, but I loved dolphins and whales when I was growing up, and I really wanted to be a cetologist, so probably that. Okay, so that was the dream as a kid. Any other dreams? I mean, besides being Mia Hamm, for those of you who know who she is. Okay, based off of the ping pong skills, I think we, we might have a little difficulty there. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. I think you were the problem. It's possible. So, do you have any hidden skills or talents that don't involve ping pong or soccer? Mm. I have so many. Um, they're hard to count. Probably thrifting, though. Everyone asks for my advice. You're hopping in a time machine. You're going back to any time period just for a day. 
Where would it be? I don't want to go anywhere. I really like, um, it might sound a little wild, but I think that the kind of work that people are doing and the kind of questions that people are doing right now are really important. And also, I don't want to be a woman in most any other era, so. I will second that. What if you could go travel into the future? Can I travel like 200 years in the future and just see where we're at? I'm hoping climate change is a problem solved. That would be a pipe dream. Now, what does artistic expression mean to you? It means mindfulness and being grounded in your world and in your feelings and in the experiences of others. Now, what has learning about machines taught you about the way that humans learn? Ooh, uh, a couple years ago I read this really interesting paper about numerosity, which is, you know, how many objects are in a particular image and how we can recognize that. And they used a neural network to explore this question. And it had a lot of interesting implications for how people understand the count of objects. All right, a lot of people are fearful of AI. Are you? I don't think I'm afraid of the same things that people are afraid of in pop culture at the moment. Um, so yes and no. What are you most excited about for AI? I'm really excited about this like growing potential for the applications of machine learning and things that can help people. So kind of like a feminist agenda. You know, um, a friend of mine just did a bunch of work in capturing and. I mean, it's a, little, it's a little sad, but she did a lot of really interesting work on capturing and highlighting these instances of femicide. And I think that's incredibly important and it's hard to do without algorithmic support. Absolutely. Now, in five years, what do you want to be working on? I hope I'm continuing work that I feel strongly about and that has impact. Um, I hope, honestly, I, I really hope that I am finding collaborations that are, you know, also interdisciplinary and that feel motivating to me. Beautiful. Now what advice would you offer to upcoming researchers trying to get involved in the field? Find someone that you think is exciting and interesting to talk to and is honestly doing interesting things and literally just have a conversation with them. It's one of the best ways to learn about a new space and it's also one of the best ways to be inspired. Okay, last and final question. We'll let you go. Where does the name Aspen come from? Um, my mom likes trees. Oh, I like trees too. All right, thanks Aspen, we'll see you later.